Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special podcast. This is really a uh, a joint podcast between Living History and the one and only Peter Hart's military history team. So joining me for this very special Anzac Day presentation, we have Gary Bain. Hello, Gary. Yeah, hi, Matt. How are you? I'm great, mate. And we also have the one and only Peter Hart. Peter, welcome back to the podcast. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> it's... Uh... Now this is all You're looking dreadful, Matt. Yeah. Have you been working? Uh, well, not very hard, as you know, but uh, they're having a few interviews, and it is in the evening here, so uh, there's been a bit of stuff going on in preparation for Anzac Day. But I, I wanted to get us together because I thought it would be great. People in Australia can't go out and commemorate Anzac Day like they normally do, so I thought we should bring Anzac Day to them. We should bring a bit of Gallipoli into their lives, and I thought, uh, who better to uh, to do that than you two? So, if for, for people listening, if you haven't heard, um. I mean, I think we'll, pop, we'll probably end up posting this on both podcasts, so this will be a little bit strange for people who tune, to bo- tune into both. But there's Peter Hart's Military History, and there's also Matt McLaughlin's Living History, our two uh, podcasts that we work on together. Uh, and I thought it would be Gary, a great has Gary to Bain got a mili- Has Gary Bain got a military history? <laughs> no, but we're thinking of uh, rebranding Peter Hart's. Gary Bain's Military History has a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a twang to it. <laughs> There'd be nothing without you, Gary. I think anyone that tunes into the podcast realises why we could not have had Peter Hart on his own. Can you believe, Pete, that when I first said to you, maybe you should do a podcast, I actually thought you'd be capable of doing it on your own? <laughs> you, you you, obviously don't know me there as well as I thought. <laughs> but I should say, if you haven't listened to the podcast, it's certainly tune in because Gary and Peter, I, I laugh hysterically. Every time, I'm the poor bugger that has to edit the thing. <laughs> Every time I have to sit there listening to you too, it does, it does, it uh, it brings tear to, tears to my eyes and mostly in a good way. Um, but it is well my favourite too. My favourite's farting dog. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the farting dog always adds a certain uh, a certain mystique to the field of military history. But um, so what I wanted to do today is we're going to bring a bit of Gallipoli to everyone's into everyone's lives since they can't go out and commemorate. And sadly, a lot of people listening to this were supposed to be at Gallipoli for Anzac Day. So I'm very sorry to those people that you're stuck at home, but hopefully we'll get through this relatively quickly and next year we'll be back bigger and better. Pete, you and I are planning to be in Gallipoli where we are planning September this year. That's not looking particularly likely, but we'll get there at some stage. Um, we will. You know, I want to start. I want to start. Gary, let's start with you. Why? What, is, what does Gallipoli mean to you? Um, you've been to Gallipoli many times. What does Gallipoli mean to you as a place? Uh, I think... The only way I can describe it is um, I've been to a number of places, uh, largely the Western Front over a number of years. I've read about uh, the Great War for about 30 years now. And uh, I've been lucky enough to go with Pete to a number of places. And um, there are two places that stick in the mind. One is Verdun and the other one is Gallipoli. You go and it grabs you. you know, it totally grabs hold of you. Um, I think... One of the places that I'd give as an example is about two or three years ago, we went to the quadrilateral and we were literally having to fight our way through the brush to get in there. And then the following year, it had been cleared and you could see everything. And I think you two had a similar experience last year with Silk Spur, where you could actually see everything. It was there. Um, Let's... Gary, I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to touch on that point because this is really quite interesting. The Turkish authorities almost spontaneously are embarking on this policy of clearing important parts of the battlefield and exposing the trenches. And it hasn't been, you know, without its critics. Some people say, oh, it should be covered up and it's going to erode, etc. What do you guys think? As regular visitors to Gallipoli, you walk the ground more often than I do. What do you think about this idea of clearing the battlefields to expose trenches and other battlefield positions? I think it, I think it's absolutely great because um, um, as long as they leave the roots in, to, which they do, to to allow the ground to remain bound up, you know, um, and possibly allow the uh, it to grow over, you know, so that they sort of do one area, then allow it to grow over again. Uh, because if you leave trenches, they they disappear, don't they? I mean, they they, they erode away. Uh, it's just fantastic to see them. And you and I, Matt, shared that fantastic. And, and Gary, we went we went uh, last later year. on in the year. To Silt Spur. Now, Silt Spur is not a big thing in the history of Gallipoli. And I barely... I knew where it was, obviously, but I didn't... I'd never been on it because it was impossible to get there. You'd never been on it either, had you? It was completely scrubbed up. But to actually go there, when we walked... You and I, Matt, we walked down Lady Galloway's Trench uh, and then we thought we had the map. Was it the 10th Battalion? I think it was. We had their map. 
and we had their map and we, we remember how excited we got following every bloody bit of it. Every even the latrine trench, uh, the tunnels that were still there. They were marked. Remember B1 and B2 and we tracked them out and um, and then and then for, for both of us, I know and I, you know what I'm going to say, that periscope post at the end of a long collapsed tunnel that overlooked, just looked across to what's its name Ridge. Uh, bloody historians never remember anything. Um, but but they, they, it just looked across to that ridge. And, and Gary, you saw it as well. You couldn't, uh, in your current state, have got down that trench because you are a little overweight. But uh, it was a thin, narrow trench. You know, me and Matt uh, managed it easily. But uh, just, that, I'll just, Pete, I just want to jump in just so people can truly understand what we're talking about here. So they've cleared a section of Australian trenches that no one, as you say, barely anyone's ever heard of. Siltspur did not rate particularly highly in the story of the campaign. It was just an area that the Australians occupied looking over the Turkish positions. But they dug an incredible network of trenches. It was like a small city of trenches and tunnels right under the noses of the Turks. And that's a fantastic chapter of history. That's a fantastic thing to read about in a book. That's amazing. Great. You read that chapter? Fantastic. What they've done is they've cleared that entire area we went there. We didn't know what we were looking at. We just knew it was some trenches near Lone Pine. We had no idea whose trenches they were, whether they were Turkish or Australian. We had no idea how they'd gotten there. We came back the next day, and in the meantime, we downloaded a map, and we had this incredible trench map that the 10th Battalion, who dug those positions, had drawn. And to say we were like kids in a lolly shop is understating it. We walked into this trench system with a map in our hands and every feature on that trench system. We could not only look at we could walk in. I remember saying to you, Pete... Go up there. I was looking at the map with my head down and you were walking ahead and I was saying, Pete, is there a left turn coming up? And you went, oh, absolutely. Another trench joins it. And I said, well, just in front, there should be the, what it says here, it's the officer's dugout. It's the headquarters dugout. And then it's like, well, by the time I got to you, you were standing there pointing mouth agape at this depression in the wall of the trench, which was the headquarter dugout. It was, I've never had an experience like it on the battlefields, being able to walk and through a trench system with a map and see every individual feature marked on that map. Just extraordinary. Yeah, I think there's. It's, uh, um, sorry, Peter. I think there's a, no. a actually a video of you two enjoying yourselves there on Living History, <laughs> Matt. It's very short, but it does actually show the area if uh, the listeners want to have a look uh, and yeah, see absolutely. how excited you two were. And watching, and it's the good thing is because I was doing the filming, it was Pete that had to appear on camera. So watching Pete get excited <laughs> as he uh, as he scrambles up and down the trenches, but really extraordinary. And I mean, and I haven't been back to Gallipoli since that trip. That was this time a year ago, Pete. And I haven't been back there since, but apparently they're doing it in all sorts of places across the peninsula, which is well, absolutely we, amazing. Well, we, we went to uh, the, the positions to the, uh, to the just to the north of uh, uh, the net, uh, Russell's Top, the uh, uh, Turk's Head, I think it is. Unbelievable. One of our chums nearly killed himself. Yeah, nearly fell off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's because he went beyond the barrier. <laughs> it says, do not pass this barrier. Uh, but the one I want to get at, do you remember when you and I, uh, get Matt, uh, went on to... Uh, uh, just by the chessboard, we went on to uh, into Bloody Angle and Dead Man's Ridge. And I think you found a bullet there. And uh, I never find anything because I'm blind. Uh, and that barbed wire, you definitely found barbed wire because I saw the picture of it uh, today. And um, that, that that was somewhere <laughs> we were fight, fighting our way through scrub. That's all been cleared now, Matt. And, and I can't wait to go back and look at it. But the other thing is there's rumours that they might be clearing Popes. I've never been on Popes. You can't get to Popes Hill. It's impossible. These are places uh, that, for, for people that don't know the geography of Gallipoli, Gallipoli is, especially the Anzac sector, is a tiny area. It's ridiculous how small the area is. And because of that, when you have 50,000 men jammed into this tiny area... They're going to name every little quarter and every bump in the ground and every hill and every trench has got some elaborate name. And because it's Gallipoli and so much went on in such a small area, an elaborate story. So when we talk about being on Dead Man's Ridge or Pope's or at Quinn's, they mean nothing now. They're, they're simply small marks on a map these days. But at the time, ferocious fighting occurred in every corner of those positions. And it's only when they clear the scrub away that you can get over there and explore it, exactly like we just talked about at Silt Spur. And it was extraordinary. And I'm, you can tell in my voice, I'm really excited to get back there and explore some of these other areas. And like can't, you say, Pete, can't wait. Pope's Hill. Um, who's ever been on Pope's... No one's been on Pope's Hill since December 1915. It's going to be absolutely extraordinary. And they are actually trying to make them, whatever you think, more accessible by putting steps in. I'm not a big fan uh... of the steps personally, but they are doing that. They're trying to make it more accessible. They've designed a walk around the battlefield as well, so you can actually you know, follow a map around the battlefield. 
And as you've mentioned, you know, Steeles, Courtney's, Queens, they were they were in action effectively for the whole period uh, of of the engagement. You know, they were never taken. They were there and they were fighting. And one of the things that Silt Spur brought home to me is you walk out of Silt Spur and there's Lone Pine. You're, you're there. It's it's that close. And uh, how close these uh, these positions were to the enemy was really brought home to me when just walking up from Silt Spur, there you are, Lone Pine, and then the Turks were, you know, 50 yards that way. Gary, the reason, that's, the reason that's such a great point is the, the one big difference we see at Gallipoli. When we talk about... Gallipoli, and we, it's very true to say the terrain has not changed much since 1915, and that is very true. It's a very strong link with history. But the one thing that has changed massively that the Anzacs would not recognise is the scrub. The scr- because it's a national park now, the scrub has just gone absolutely crazy. It's more than head high in most places. And you just can't see things. You can't, you can't get the perspective that the Anzacs had. Obviously, they weren't putting their heads above the trench to look around like we would do. Uh, but um, you, you don't get that perspective simply because of the scrub. And for years, I've been saying... Uh, you know, it would be good if they put goats back in there, to, like they used to have in the back in immediately after the war. It used to be stripped bare by goats, or you know, there was a, there was a bushfire in the nineties. We don't want that to happen again. But um, but it's you know, it's the scrub is an impediment to understanding the layout of the battlefield and to connecting with that history. So I I'm hugely in favour of it. And the other thing we always say, and Pete, I know you're a big fan of this, is walking the ground. Most people, the vast majority, ninety five percent of people who visit Gallipoli travel on a coach or in a car. They go around the big loop that there is. I'm talking about the Anzac sector now. They go around the big loop. They stop at each site. They get off, take a photo, look at a cemetery or a memorial, back on the bus, and around they go. If you venture even slightly off the road and walk on some of those tracks, it's a whole new world, isn't it? It, it is. And uh, well, we, what, one of our favourite mutual friends, uh, Bolent Yorkmus, uh, to, to show how inflexible some of the tour trips are, is his favourite thing. If they run slightly behind, he will say, Simpson's grave closed for renovation. <laughs> <laughs> they just missed that out. Now, that that's what happens to... He doesn't do... I mean, he's the greatest walking guide and you've been with him, uh, other than Mal Tepe, where he does get lost. Uh, <laughs> you... you you, you, you can't imagine, you know, I mean, if you just go round for what, a three hour trip, you're going to see bugger all and they're going to they're going to trip trim the trip to their timetable. Uh, but if you take the time to go on a proper trip with proper guides and then Bolent is reborn as this fantastic guide, he'll take you anywhere and 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 face any challenge you throw in front of him. You know, you say you want to go to uh, the boot, which is uh, off, uh, you know, you haven't been there, Matt. That's why I mentioned it. Uh, Gary's and, looking Gary's and, looking panicked as we mentioned that. So I, I, yes. I think he's going to wake up screaming tonight with nightmares of going to the boot. <laughs> the boot is a challenge. But uh, funnily enough, Gary, Gary was great on it. Uh, some people suffer going to the boot. Uh, but there are lots of challenges. And, and, and a really good Turkish guide will just, you know, you say you want to go somewhere and they'll take you there. Um, and and uh, the the, ch- the physical challenges are, are, are quite great for elderly gentlemen like myself. But but w- one thing that's interesting is however hot you get, however much those spiky plants stick in your ass and the rest of your body, um, however much you're sweating. Remember, we've got as much water as we need always. And uh, and actually, we're, we're, we're not carrying 80 pounds of weight. Uh, we haven't got dysentery. Usually, oh, yes. Gary does. Uh, <laughs> Gary does. Okay, we all from we Bain's all suffer disease. from a we all suffer from a minor <laughs> bout of the you know just 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 so we have some understanding of what they went through. No one's been to Gallipoli without a little touch of. Well, the that's that that's the point. A little bit. Of, I mean, it, you know, at Gallipoli, it, it can be a tough environment, but we 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 never get to experience anything the men did, and that was brought home for me recently when writing the, the book for uh, Living History that's going to come out in whenever Octoberish on the evacuation, and, and we talked about it on a, a previous episode about the the great freeze i'd never really realized how awful that was until you study these things and you just you just realize that one that minute it's summer and the next minute it's freezing and when i say freezing 20 degrees below and i mean centigrade yeah, go back uh, and listen just... to the podcast that we did a couple of weeks ago on this pete and i did on the great storm at gallipoli because it's terrifying the, as as winter rolled in right at the end of the campaign the, the place to it's it's so exposed the, the, it's so harsh the climate at both ends of the scale and when winter started to roll in storms flooding ice snow men were dying of exposure frostbite drowning in their trenches just just a horrific part of the story we don't understand so go and listen to the living history podcast about that that we did a few weeks ago and look out and for pete's book better. and look out for pete's book well, well, on the evacuation which is coming out uh, later in the year 
Jeez, can I, how many and plugs can I get in? Bad. How many plugs can Garrett. I get in in one set in one sentence? <laughs> and, and I'm just going to say that podcast was so much better because Gary wasn't on it. You know, it's just, <laughs> it was like being freed. <laughs> oh, yeah, but that's, freed it, from a. <laughs> that's that's why I'm here. There were so many complaints about a lack of eye candy. <laughs> Pete, I want to ask you something. Um, I've done a lot of interviews this week in the lead up to Anzac Day, and a, a common question for Australians is why does Gallipoli still resonate? Um, and I've done my best to answer that. We talk a lot about national identity and nations, you know, forged in bloodshed and all those quite grand concepts. Give me a British perspective, though. Where does Gallipoli sit in the in the story of Britain at war? Uh, it's just one of almost innumerable cock-ups. Um, for us, I mean, we, we, we've, we've been in campaigns like this before. We're a long-standing uh, naval and very slightly military uh, country. Uh, it's just one part of a three, four, five hundred year history. Uh, it doesn't resonate anywhere near as much as it does for the Australians and New Zealanders. Uh, and even less, it resonates for the French, of course who also have a long and glorious history. Their history, military-wise, is much more glorious than ours. And, and they're not bothered because it's just one of many, many things that are going on. Uh, I, I think Gary may have something that yeah. he wishes to add here. Can I interject here? I, I think there's something in the British psyche about failure. So Tennyson didn't write about, you know, the the poor logistics having no winter clothing. He wrote about the glorious failure of the 600 riding into the Valley of Death. Islandwana. Nobody talks about Islandwana. It's all about Rourke's drift late of the day and all the VCs and everything there. Gallipoli, from a British perspective, was a glorious failure. And there's something in our psyche that almost celebrates the failures. So I think that... um, the focus for the British will be on, you know, Pete's got a book coming out later in the year, The Evacuation. A fantastic success at the end of a glorious failure. And I think that's the British psyche. Do you think, Gary, that people in Britain even think particularly about about Gallipoli? I mean, tomorrow is 25th of April in Australia. Are people Well, today, when this podcast comes out, it'll be out on Anzac Day. Are people in Britain even going to realize that there's anything to be remembering that day no not at all and uh, you know i think peter hits the nail on the head there there is so much more about nationhood for the australians and new zealanders than there is for the british to the british it was just another engagement on a faraway shore and most people if you said to them where is gallipoli in britain would say italy because they've been on holiday there <laughs> And that's a fact. You know, they, they just would not understand the concept of what that meant, not only for, you know, the, the nations of Australia and New Zealand, but Turkey as well. You know, Turkey came out of that war a very different country to the one that entered it. Uh, and I think there's a complete lack of understanding. That's why historians like yourself, like Pete, are very important in getting that message across. And, of course, now one of the... Uh, uh, side effects of this uh, terrible, terrible um, coronavirus is people are using technology more and developing a thirst for this. And, you know, our own podcast in, in a very short time has attracted quite a lot of listeners because there seems to be a thirst for it. I think, Gary, I think you're absolutely right in that regard. And I'm going to touch on a point you made about Australians and New Zealanders. And I'm going to put you both on the spot. You've met a lot of boorish Australians and New Zealanders, particularly when we're thrashing you at cricket or rugby. Um, what, in your perspective, why do you think this notion of Gallipoli, which is more than a battlefield, it's more than a place, it's a, it's a place in all our hearts if you're an Australian and a New Zealander, why is this so important to us? What do you think? Well, I, I've, I've met a lot. I, I mean, because I, I, I was a tour guide for you uh, on the uh, uh, unrepeatable uh, visits to uh, on 25th of April to, to the dawn ceremony. Yeah, you know, you, you can't get anything more dramatic or intense than that for an Australian or, or New Zealander. Um, I, I th- I th- I... The people who go there uh, are not ockers, in my view. Um, I, I, that's a derogatory term, which I, I you know, th- I'm, I'm saying they're not. Uh, I found that they were interested to learn and when they got there they were interested in what the British did they were even interested in what the French did that they, they had a, a, a good view I also have the highest regard for the generation 
of Australian historians, of which you're one, Matt, but which we could name, and you have on your Living History podcast. Uh, so Carl James, wonderful historian, uh, Michael McKentin, uh, uh, Reese Crawley, uh, uh, Aaron Pegram, uh, you know, the, uh, are now uh, Chris Roberts, uh, Peter Pedersen. Uh, these guys are brilliant. And they are not in any way going for the myths and legends. And they tell the story as it is, as do you, Matt, and your book's not got rubbish in it, you know, as some of the sillier historians uh, have got. Um, and I think when you tell the story properly, it's a more interesting story. Because, uh, you know, if you just tell a story and, and add bits for book sales, as uh, you know, or, or that kind of thing, in the end, people just say, oh, it's all bollocks. Well, it isn't all bollocks. There's a, a, a solid foundation of fact uh, in, in all of it. Albert Jacker was a, a living incarnation of Sharp, which may not be relevant to Australian visitors. But, you know, if you ever want to explain what Albert Jacker was, you know, he's the man like Richard Sharp. If, if he went into a room with 10 heavily armed Turks and he had a toothpick, you know... <laughs> that five minutes later, there'd be, there'd be a load of dead Turks, around, and they'd all be dead, by the way, knowing uh, Jacka. They didn't seem to take many prisoners. And he'd be fine. He'd probably have a decorative wound in the arm, just like Richard Sharp. And, and, but the, is that based on fact? Yes, it is. That's what he was like. You know, that's an exaggeration. But that's what he was like. You know, uh, the, the, the stories of Quinns are all true. The, the stories of the New Zealanders on... Uh, uh, Wellington Battalion and Malone, William Malone, what a hero. The stories are based in fact. You don't need to exaggerate like I just actually just caught myself out exaggerating about Jacker. But you don't need to do that, do you? No, but there is an element, you, you touched on it, there is an element of the legend as well. You know, there's the legend of the bite out of Anzac. Um, so you can actually see that when you get there, if you're standing on the beaches, you can see the heights, you can see, you know, what the objectives were in those first few hours after, after landing, you can see that the legend of the digger, you know, that was all born there. Most people don't realize there was a high proportion of British born people in the uh, Australian Corps. And so, you know, this legend does surround it. And when you get there, you can stand there and imagine all this in your, in your mind's eye. You can stand at Aribanu and, and see, you know, you look up, there's the Sphinx. It's there. You know, you can see Walker's Ridge. Some of us haven't walked it, but you can see it. Um, Cowards. Yeah. And to get back to Pete's earlier point, if you walk it, you see things that you'd miss. So, for example, if you go to um, Gully Beach on the entrance to Gully Ravine, Gully Ravine's a hard slog. You know, don't get me wrong, it is, but it's well worth doing, at the mouth of which is Joe Murray's well. You know, and you miss that sort of thing if you don't get out there. But if you, if you do, it's going to grab you and you're going to go again and again and again. Well, there's a there's a word I'm going to use, and I hesitate to use it, but there's a romance to the place. There is, you know, we don't like to glorify war. There's a lot of, you know, it's it's awful what we're talking about here. It's a lot of death and destruction. It's pretty horrific stuff we're talking about, but there is a romance to the story. There's a, there, there's not a romance to the individual experience, but there's a romance to the tale. There's a romance to the the Greek tragedy that is the Gallipoli campaign, and that comes out in in you know everything that you uh, you you feel when you're there. I mean. Gary, I'm going to ask you, what's what's the British equivalent, so that Australians understand, what's the British equivalent to Gallipoli, in your Well, opinion? I think there's possibly two. Uh, I spent a number of years going on my own to the Eep Salient. Um, you haven't got many friends. That's true. Um, well, I've got three, and one of them's a spare in case something happens to one of the others. Um, so I'd go to, for Eeps, I think, is an equivalent, and possibly the Somme, Although I think that's such a large area that people focus on a very small part of it. So they sort of focus on Beaumont Hamel. Uh, but actually, I think that's probably the two equivalents. Well, the first uh, and, and, day is the first day on the Somme the British equivalent of. Uh, of yeah, the, that's what I'm saying. The Gallipoli landings. They, they yeah. concentrate in a very small area of the Somme and the battle. They look at the 1st of July largely. So it's around the Beaumont Hamel area. Um, and, and I think that's the equivalent because. Um, probably because of the losses, frankly, on the first day. 
So what? To, so what's the future? What, what what is Gallipoli going to continue to loom large? Are we going to learn something new about Gallipoli that we don't know that's going to turn it on its head? Are people going to want to go there in the future? Where do you think Gallipoli is heading in the future? I think the more we learn, the more we understand about it. And it's crucial to keep learning. I've just learned loads more about the evacuation. But every aspect of the logistics of the campaign are fascinating. Uh, visiting the islands, uh, visiting the air bases, that was great. You know, Tenedos and Imbros. Uh, I'm determined to visit... Uh, uh, Lemnos to see the harbour and to visit Charles Lister, his particular hero of mine's grave. Um, there's so much more to do. The, the, the thing about G Gallipoli is there's always more to learn. Uh, but, but if you once you've been once, you're going to go again. And there's although nationally we have little interest in it, there is. I think it's not fair without mentioning the Gallipoli Association. And the Glippley Association, with historians like Stephen Chambers and uh, and touring groups, will continue to visit. I mean, there are six thousand or so members of the Glippley Association, and and so it's it's a niche interest. I mean, there's plenty of Australians within that number as well. It's a niche interest, and uh, the the Glippley Association will continue to thrive. Uh, it has a magazine, and it, it's just great. There there are websites. There's a Gallipoli 1915. Uh, uh, Facebook page which has God ten thousand followers. You know there are lots of there's lots of interest, uh, but the future is always. It's not populist books. That I don't believe there's any. Well, they'll make people money, but to me, what the the future now is to trim down to look at individual battles. I'm looking at the possibility of persuading um, any stupid publisher. Hi Matt, uh, <laughs> to to write a a history of Second Crithia. Uh, I was thinking of writing a third Krithia, but I, I just suddenly realised that second Krithia uh, is bigger in many sense because all three forces, you know, all uh, the Anzacs, the British, and the French are involved. Everyone, uh, you, you so, can be, you can hear this live that when I, when Pete and I just have our book contract negotiations. But Pete, go for it. Twenty twenty one. Look out for a book from Peter Hart on uh, second Krithia. I'm looking forward to reading that one. But, but the point, you see what I mean, but. If you focus in on that one small aspect, you'll, you'll learn more. You'll learn about the French, which I think we all need to do. All of us need to learn more about the French. Uh, Gary, sorry, yes. Yeah, I was just going to say, I spent the week um, proofreading your forthcoming book on the evacuation. And uh, without giving too much away, it, you know, it mentions towards the end of, of the book about uh, taking over the French sector, so the French are released, in return for the 75s and the, and it mentions the destruction of the the french guns the french heavies well you can see them you know they're there you can see the the uh, the destruction to the guns done in order to make them inoperative it's there you can touch it you can feel it so when i was reading that passage i guarantee you i could see the rusty guns in my head um and that's what you get from visiting you can't get that from a book you know it, no, e even you can't. even a peter hart book oh, which has <laughs> lots of pictures and coloring in to do but you can't well, the coloring in is a vital part <laughs> and if, if matt misses out you'll see if he's been cheapskating yeah. if it doesn't have a coloring in section I, I'm, I'm telling all of you now if it hasn't got a coloring in section that's down to matt and his cheapskating <laughs> or editing <laughs> <laughs> or editing, yeah. or saving your reputation, um, Pete. <laughs> yeah. What reputation? A bit late for that. <laughs> we were talking. We we're talking about the French. What about the Turks? The, the, to me, there's a good. I'm not going to say 50 percent of the story that's untold because we know a little bit about. But there's a good 40 percent of the story yet to be revealed. I mean, I, I know that there's some excellent Turkish historians who are every year coming up with more and more amazing information about what the Turks were going through and their experiences and why they did the things they did. But, gee, it's been overlooked for a long time. The story of Gallipoli, it seems to be the only battle that we've ever been engaged in where there was no enemy because we just don't hear anything about the Turks. They represent the blokes on the machine guns or the blokes making a charge on May 19. We, we don't hear anything about their plans, what they were doing, how they managed to pull off what was a great victory for them. That I I think uh, uh, this is a point a, a point well made. Uh, I mean, for me, I, I learned more from Kenan Chelik, who's uh, uh, been attached to the Australian to, for, 
for, for a long time. Kenan Çelik taught me more than probably anybody else about the battlefield, about the Turks. Uh, there are other great... Uh, Bulent Yorkmus, the guide, knows a great deal. There are many others. And Bill Sellers, uh, an Australian who lives in, uh, in Eshebat, is also a brilliant. And there are many, many others who are working hard. Halu Goral, uh, they're, they're, they're working hard. And Harvey Broadbent, who I, I don't know personally, I, I met him once, across a crowded room uh, but he certainly didn't notice me and uh, he has been doing an enormous amount of work and published that work which 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 looks at the Turks but I, I was saying this on a, a, a Adam Blunn a friend of yours podcast uh, if you don't know the name of the Turkish corps commander if you only know the names of uh, of uh, Sefik Ala Aka, Sefik Aka I don't even know his name and uh, and Ataturk uh, Mustafa Kemal. If you only know those names and Canning Geyser and Liman van Sanders, you don't know Gallipoli. What's Matt? What's the name of the corps commander at Gallipoli, the Turkish corps oh, commander? You're gonna and don't catch- say I'm Pasha. so glad you yeah, asked, uh, Matt. Yeah, uh, Pasha, is it Pasha Bay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to but do you see what a. No, uh, no. <laughs> well done, Gary. Well done, Matt. You're both. <laughs> You're both pissing in the wind here, but you're both right in some way. What I mean is, I don't know either. So this is not humiliating you, Matt, or you, Gary. Well, it is humiliating for you. Almost everything's humiliating for you. And it's not, but, it's not hard to humiliate me either. <laughs> but the point about it is, I don't know either. And, and I, don't think, I don't think Stephen Chambers can probably remember either. He's the other... One of the great uh, British historians that, that work in this field. The point is, we don't know enough about these people. We need more because we're too lazy to. Well, you can't learn Turkish because it's old Ottoman. Uh, it's a, it's an, an Arabic script, I believe, and uh, the, so even Turks can't read it. So there's a great difficulty in getting at the original sources. But we need to know more. And I think Harvey Broadbent, you might know him, Matt, I don't. But I think he's done us a great service. I'm sure he was paid for it. But he's done us a great service in looking at the Turkish accounts and, and exploding some of the myths, or for reasonable historians, he's exploded some of the myths. Also, I would add, you know, at the time, I think that uh, certainly the British view of... of um Johnny Turk, for want of a better description, was that he wasn't a very good soldier. Now, there is an argument that in the attack, the Turkish soldier was not that brilliant. But in the defence, he was a good soldier. He was defending his homeland. He knew what he was doing. He was well led. And they had a good logistics, eventually, uh, supply. And actually, they're good soldiers in the defence. And I think that needs to be told because... There is a focus on on the Brits, and uh, uh, I'm including the the Australians and New Zealands in that description. There is a focus on the Brits, but actually the Turks were defending their homeland, and they did it well, and they fought bloody hard. And anyone who was there would have acknowledged how hard that fighting was. It's the great fallacy. They do. It's a great fallacy we often have about history these days, which always strikes me as quite interesting. We do the same thing when we talk about the Allies winning the First World War in 1918, for example, we take the enemy out of the equation. So it's almost like when we talk about the Western Front and the war being won, it's almost as if we discuss it in terms of, oh, well, we just decided one day, let's end the war, let's just win the thing. We make the same mistake when we talk about Gallipoli, when we talk about, oh, they were held up in their attack and the British couldn't advance towards Archie Barber and the Australians couldn't break out of Second Ridge. Well, they, could, they couldn't do these things because there was a determined enemy trying to stop them. It wasn't that they tried to move out of their trenches and all fell over at the same time. I mean, there was a very determined enemy that was stopping them from doing these things. So we do look at it incredibly in a one-sided perspective. What were we doing? Why were we stopped in this attack? We were stopped because there were good Turkish defenders there. And they did a wonderful job. They, they won the Gallipoli campaign by defending brilliantly. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, I mean, people, for instance, the 4th of June, we go on and on about, did Hunter West and Hamilton miss an opportunity on the 4th of June by reinforcing failure instead of reinforcing success in the centre? But my angle on that story is, uh, is firstly, the Turks fought hard in defence. But then they launch, the next two days, they launch a series of vicious counterattacks and we're only just holding on to such an extent that Dallas Moore, a young second lieutenant who's commanding the Hampshires, and that's a sign, second lieutenant commanding the Hampshires, uh, gets a VC because he had to shoot some of the, the, their own men and then lead a counterattack to, to hold a trench. To me, third, third, third Krithia, 
doesn't start and end on the 4th of June. It, there's three days of it. One day of us attacking and then two days of, of Turkish counterattacks. Uh, not particularly, as Gary rightly said, not particularly brilliant counterattacks. They're, they're not very good at it uh, because they, they attack a bit like us. They just charge over, you know, shouting for their God instead of our God. That's the only difference. Uh, people keep, you know, uh, and they, they get slaughtered. But they do nearly break through on the 5th and 6th of uh, June. And this is what you're saying, Matt. It's what Gary saying. It's what I'm saying is look at the other side. The, the difficulty is we need more things translating, more things put into the market. I would love to read whatever that core commander's memoirs were. I believe they've been written. It's just they're in Turkish. Um, that, for me, is part of the future, you know, as well as focusing in on narr not just another book that tells the whole story, you know, chapter one, the landing, chapter two, uh, you know, the, the, the stalemate at Anza, chapter three, the British attacks at Hellas, chapter, f do you know what I mean? Because the books all end up the same, uh, whether it be my book or Richard Van Emden, your favourite Gary's book or any of the others. Um, they all end up the same. If you, so you need to have a narrower focus on individual parts of the campaign and you need to look properly at Turkish and French uh, sources so that you get a, a wider picture. I think that's absolutely essential and I'm, I'm hopeful that that is what happens in the future. And, you know, Pete, in our own little way, we're doing it a bit by your evacuation book that's coming up later this year. Um, you know, we're, we're doing that a bit because we're starting to break it down. We're starting, you know, as you said, even the it's, it even exposed things that you didn't realise about about the evacuation yeah. and that, that whole period, which I think is going to be wonderful. Um, gents, I want to finish up a little bit philosophically. I want to ask you, Gary, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to put you on the spot. Why is any of this important? Why is it important that we remember Gallipoli? It's Anzac Day. This To Australians and New Zealanders, this is the day of remembrance. It's our only day of coming together as a nation with, uh, you know, without division. It means something to the people of Britain. Why, why is all of this important? I think, you know, putting aside for, for one moment why history itself is important, you know, you, you learn lessons from history. That's the point. Um, I think that, you know, Gallipoli was um, an enormous sacrifice for what people perceive as very little reason. You, know, you can argue all day long about whether you know it was Churchill's folly or Kitchener's role or the War Council or whatever, but it's seen as you know a failure. But out of that failure was born a nation in the sense that both New Zealand and Australia, up until that point, saw Britain as the mother country. You know, they immediately offered, I think Australia offered 20,000 troops immediately that war was declared to the mother country. From Gallipoli onwards, they were a nation. And I think it's important that that's recognised because there was a huge sacrifice in order for that to happen. Pete, what do you reckon? Why is any of this important? I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm in awe of Gary's uh, grasp of that. And I, not grasp it, because you'd expect mate. it, but I just... Uh, <laughs> yes, that was uh, damning with faint praise by accident. I do apologise. <laughs> what I mean was that's just spot on is what I mean, and I can't improve on that. So I'm going to have to to, to, to look at another angle. For me, um, it's important to remember those people. Uh, and this is more sentimental than I usually am, but those people, that Joe Murray, uh, the, 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 the veteran I interviewed, I read his book when I was about 12, and then I had the pleasure of interviewing him for 21, 22 hours, which you can listen to on the IWM website. Just listen. Uh, t 21 hours of me and him. But amazing, man. Uh, Charles Lister, the Royal Naval Division. If you want a definition of the word louche, that's a definition. He's, one of the funniest bits is when he's watching Freiburg, the new great New Zealand war hero, uh, putting on the black oil stuff he rubbed all over his body before he went on the diversionary swim at Cape Saros. If you don't know about more of that... You just, but L Lister's discussion, a description of how he uh, watched this, it's just fascinating. And then, and then, of course, but he was a very brave officer as well. Uh, what a character. Rupert Brooke, who died before he even got there. What a great character. Um, lots of people. Uh, Malone, William Malone. I know I, I love him for so many reasons. One of them being that he was more rude about Australians than even Gary could be. And Gary can be pretty rude about... Australians when he's not on a podcast I can assure you but he's 
William Miller, you you know who, you know, the commander of the Wellington Regiment. What a hero. Um, uh, Monash, conflicted in his personal uh, performance at Gallipoli, goes on to become a, a very, very great uh, general. But what an interesting character. Doesn't visit the front lines. Uh, but brilliant at organising. Even then, he was showing signs. All these characters, Hamilton, everybody. That, so for me, besides everything that Gary said, which I entirely endorse, that's the characters, the stories. And I would add to that, you know, the, the Kirkpatricks of this uh, of this world, you know, the man with the donkey, that sort of character. Sorry, you probably know him as Simpson um, or yes. Murphy or any other sort of name that he had at the time. But those sorts of characters, you know, they, they come to life and they bring home how much was sacrificed for that campaign. Well, Peter and Gary, thanks so much for participating in this special Anzac Day joint podcast. Um, depending on which podcast you're listening to, look out for Peter and Gary's uh, podcast, which is Peter Hart's Military History. Uh, and if you're listening to it on that channel, look out for my podcast, which is Living History with Matt McLaughlin. But it's great that we can come together on Anzac Day to continue looking at Gallipoli, to unpack it a little bit more and keep asking these questions because it's just such an iconic campaign. So guys, just thank you so much for being involved. Well, that's been great fun. Thank you very much for having us on, Matt. And thank you, Gary, for your, <laughs> for your <laughs> well, everything you do. Cheers, lads. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Pete. I uh, hope to see you all soon. Stay safe.